Ben, when we think about God, abortion, sin, there is a tendency not to recognize God's grace. Jim Caviezel spoke to this issue in 2010. And here's what actor he played in The Passion of Christ. He also, my, my memory from him was from Murder, She Wrote. But there are other, he was a pers person of interest on CBS, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Jeremy, fan of that show. And so, actor, and he was evangelizing. And here's what he had to say. And I thought it was beautiful, but I thought it was especially on target in light of the conversations that we have on a weekly basis, Ben, and the great work that you do, not only as U.S. Bureau Chief of LifeSite News, but as a pastor. Roll it. Some of you have had abortions. Some men here and women are adulterers. Some have committed murder. Some of you didn't have the abortion, but you paid for it, so you have contributed to this. Many people are part of this great sin in this country. Over 50 million in the United States alone. 45 million die every year in the world. These are all God's children and God brings them home. Now he wants to bring you home. Now, in this moment. This is a chance for heaven right now. You don't have to wait to die to experience heaven. But when you committed this sin any of the Ten Commandments or the sin of abortion or contributed to it. Let me be very clear. Did you go to one of your friends and ask your friend, hear my story? And you say, yes, I went to one person. I said, why do you go to this person to confide in this sin to them? Because they didn't judge me. Because they loved me. Because I felt mercy and grace. Now, I ask you this. Do you think that your God doesn't have more mercy than your friend? Do you think your friend has more grace than God? Does your friend have more love than the Creator? It can never be. It can never be. So, God forgives you. And now He needs you to begin again. Ben, is that a message we need to hear more? It's the most important message that there is. It's the reason that AFR is on the air. It's the reason that uh, uh, a man named Crane Durham uh, became uh, went through the uh, the journey that you talked about, being someone who is a Christian in name to someone who is progressing. And someone named Ben Johnson went through the exact same thing and is still on that path, uh, not as far as he'd like to be, but is still on that path. And Everyone, one way or another, uh, is is on this same pathway that God has taken us into into His hands, created us, placed us into this world, surrounded us with His love, and He's left it up to us to realize it uh, and and to reciprocate. That's all that we have to do in this world is to reciprocate the love that God gives us. And it doesn't make any difference whether we've uh, been involved in abortion or whether we've been on the other side opposing abortion. Every one of us is a sinner in the eyes of God. None of us is better than anyone else in the eyes of God. Uh, we, we have all committed sins, we are all guilty, and yet he loves us all despite that. And that's the image that uh, we need to bring before those who have been involved in abortion and those who have been involved fighting abortion. The fact that we have a loving Father who wants to reconcile all of us, uh, those who have committed abortions, those who have performed abortions. God wants to reconcile all of us into his family. We are all God's children. He wants to bring everyone home around that throne in heaven uh, and reflect the, the beautiful diversity of his creation by having everyone there. Saints, sinners, he wants all of us to be wiped, washed clean in the blood of Christ and reconciled to him. We have to remember God is a loving father. Uh, too often, because of problems at home or, or uh, in, in our families or in other families, uh, we have a, a vision when they say God is like Father, people recoil a little bit. And the fact of the matter is God is the perfect, loving Father. 
Uh, so it doesn't make any difference. I've spoken to women who have had abortions. I've spoken to men who've paid for abortions, and they are haunted by what happened. Uh, we have to remember, although we stand firm against abortions, we stand against anything that is a violation of God's law, uh, we still love all those people, and we have to embody the love of Christ by reaching out in love and mercy and tenderness to be there uh, when the abortionist will not be. After the abortion, the abortionist is gone. We will be there to help them pick up the pieces and to continue to put their life together and to start anew and to make that journey all the way to the throne room of Christ. Uh, you know, Jim Caviezel was in another uh, TV series called The Prisoner. It's a remake of an old uh, BBC show. And uh, people who have been involved in abortion one way or another are prisoners. We're all prisoners to sin. Jesus Christ came to set us free and to give us a deed to the greatest kingdom in the universe. That's what he set before us. I'm glad that Jim Caviezel is bringing that message to bring us all home to the throne of grace. Tell me, Ben, when I think about... I, I can't not watch this clip without crying it, it, or tears coming in my eyes. And I think about that because I think about how there are so many who have been impacted by abortion. They may have paid for it. They may have known about it. They may have even counseled someone to do that and obviously feel that that weight that guilt of advocating for something that is the taking of the life of the child and there what surprised me in the discussion of abortion in general is there are so many who have hid this from god maybe they've told a friend but they've hid it from God because they are afraid of God and, and, and quite frankly, the emotion of bringing it up and discussing it. And the enemy, as Satan sits there, being the great accuser, he's saying, he's telling, don't go to God with this. Don't go, no, he won't forgive you. Those are the enemy's lies. And he tries to use that as the foothold and the divider between God and his children, as we all are. You've seen this, I am sure, countless times as a pastor, as a man of God, as someone who counsels others. What advice do you have for the rest of us as we sit back and we hear these stories? We may encounter them. I encountered them in the most, I didn't expect it. All of a sudden, because they knew I was pro-life, somebody would uh, know I was pro-life, it all of a sudden became an issue. I didn't bring it up. I wasn't discuss I wasn't having it. I was just having a conversation. And the person would tell me their, the, what they had been through. And I think, oh, to hold that, to hold that, the pain and the shame, the the and to believe the enemy's lie about God's unwillingness to forgive. Your thoughts? Well, I think that there are two things. Sometimes we sin because we don't have enough shame. You know, we're not, we're not, um, we're not ashamed to sin. I think a lot more often we don't sin, or we do sin because we don't have enough joy. We don't have enough joy in God. We don't have a proper perspective of how good and how loving, how joyful... It is to be in the presence of God. And so, uh, you know, perhaps it's because we were raised in the church and we had a, a very thin, um, almost uh, uh, business-like relationship with God, and we didn't ever have the real personal, deep relationship with God we need to have. When you have that, it fills you with so much joy uh, that you don't want to have anything that would uh, come between you and God, and that is what so often restrains us. Not, not a fear, not threats. Uh, it's that we have such great... Uh, such a great sense of God's love and mercy and forgiveness, and um, the tributaries of His mercy and blessing are just pouring out upon us like uh, like oil on the head that runs down on the beard, as it says in the Psalms. You know, we have we have shame because we think that God is waiting like a judge, waiting to cast us into hell, waiting to throw us into the fiery pit, and that is not the way that our God is. Uh, our God is a God of love and a God of justice, but a God above all of mercy. 
a God of mercy. He says, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. And so he's constantly trying to reach out and bring us back to that place of grace and to restore that loving relationship which has been broken for our sins, but which has been restored by him in Jesus Christ. And so you hear Jim Caviezel, who, uh, you know, portrayed the passion of the Christ so beautifully, and now he comes in with his words, he embodies what that means. Uh, he symbolized, you know, he, he symbolized it on film, but then he, uh, he, he brought it together in a message, and you can understand this is why Christ died this way. He gave his body, uh, he shed his blood, he died on the cross for our sins. And he's coming back in, in order to, uh, get his, he sent his Holy Spirit to us in order to fill us and to uh, unite us to that sacrifice on the cross so that we can have joy in this world and that that joy will be abiding and continue forever. If we have that proper perspective of a loving God who willingly sacrificed himself for us without any compulsion, without any need, uh, he wrote the rule book so he could, he could have redeemed us any way he wanted to. He deliberately left heaven came to earth, lived a sinless life, and redeemed us with his own blood through such great suffering, out of love and joy, uh, because of the joy that was said before him, which was reconciling all of his children, everyone in the world, to him, uh, to bring us into that great heavenly banquet, uh, the, the Supper of the Lamb, which we've all experienced for all of eternity. One of the ways that we also cover the issues, Ben, that was beautiful is to expose how things are portrayed by the mainstream media. Morgan Spurlock, who is famous for Fast Food Nation, if I'm not, or Super Size Me, he did a report on religion. And here are some excerpts from that from newsbusters.org. Roll it. When you vote for somebody who wants to change the definition of marriage, for somebody who wants to promote homosexuality as the same as traditional marriage. You have a problem in your walk with God, you have a problem in your biblical understanding. After seeing the sermon, some of the messages, especially being somebody who has a lot of friends and family who are homosexuals, it's, you know, it's hard to, uh, hard to believe that it's, there's only one way. And it's part of the problem that I, have with religion in general. In a world where we live and people continue to talk about the separation of church and state, mm -hmm. is the pulpit a place to talk about issues? Maybe not the most tolerant views from Pastor Davis, but then again, religion is not without its controversies. Guided by her faith, Rimsia sprang to action in 2011 to battle an anti-Sharia bill that had been introduced at the state level. In effect, the bill would have outlawed being a practicing Muslim in Tennessee. The bill is an attack on Muslims. Besides even just Muslims, it's an attack on religious freedom. Today, Ramsey and I are lobbying against an education bill. House Bill 1129, okay. um, that's going to be on the calendar next week. That could limit the teaching of minority achievements in school curriculum. I can say that we're going to count on your support. 110%. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice job. She, she killed it. Tell me something. Uh, th there you have two, him at a Christian service talking about homosexuality. And then he's reporting, obviously, excerpts from the report that he did on a anti-Sharia anti law that was in the Tennessee State House. One very sympathetic, the other more critical, uh, the for former versus the latter. Uh, your thoughts on the coverage of Christianity by the mainstream media and, and the context. You know, Morgan Spurlock, you know, of course, as you mentioned, he was nominated for an Academy Award for Super Size Me back in 2004-2005, and uh, they later found out, of course, that he had lied through the entire film. Uh, the idea was that he was going to eat at McDonald's every day, and nobody could reproduce his results. As it turned out, he stopped exercising, he exaggerated uh, how many calories he had, and uh, he, he threw the results. It wasn't a documentary so much as, as a sort of a documentary fiction. And they decided he was such a good liar, he, decided he deserved an Academy Award, and then they promoted him up to CNN. So uh, where, where uh, lying is the, uh, the currency of your, your convictions up there. So uh, he's, he's on CNN now. I think two things jumped out about this piece to me. First of all, 
uh, he said, is the pulpit the place to discuss issues? You and I remember a few years ago, they always said that uh, you could have your religion, but just talk about these things in church. Don't bring your morality into the public square. Talk about anything you want to in church. Now they say, don't even talk about it in church. Uh, that jumped out to me. That's but then second point. of all, yes, go ahead. And then second of all, he's talking about Islam uh, and how uh, he's, he's opposed to a law that would ban Sharia. Uh, in the one half, he talks about separation of church and state. He says, with separation of church and state, should you even be talking about political issues in the Christian context? On the other hand, he's against a bill that would ban Sharia which says there is no separation between mosque and state. Everything must be run in accordance with the will of Allah or else. Uh, so it would seem to me that there is some tension in his views, cognitive. which is not fully resolved. Yeah, cognitive dissonance, uh, certainly. Ben Johnson, U.S. Bureau Chief, as I said, I wish I had more time. Thank you so much. I love how we did two stories, one on God's grace, and then another story about how things are presented and as if we could compartmentalize our views and a total almost schizophrenic interpretation by the likes of CNN when it comes to their opinions and understanding brilliantly analyzed and pointed out by our good friend Ben Johnson, U.S. Bureau Chief Lifesight News. Have a great weekend, Ben. Thank you, brother. See you. You too, Governor. AFR Talk. <laughs>